Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope it's not here. Um, yes. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Jeff Hinchcliffe, I'm in the School of Education. I just want to tell you a little bit um, about, about the lecture series, which is on education, um, spread over the next, um, uh, over the next two months. There's going to be five lectures. And it's a result of a collaboration between the School of Philosophy, represented by this gentleman here, and the School of Education, represented by this distinguished gentleman here. And the idea is that, is that um, there's always been a strong connection between philosophy and education, going right back to Plato. But we're going to be focusing on education in the 20th and 21st century. And as you know from looking at the leaflet, we're going to look at the past, which is what we're going to look at today. Not the distant past, but the very recent past. Um, then we're going to look at the present as well. Um, that will be next week on the 8th of February on the 22nd. And then in March, on the 15th and the 22nd of March, we'll be looking at um, what future educational landscape. So this is a result then of the collaboration between two schools interacting, interdisciplinary uh, uh, knowledge um, in, in practice, as you might say. So without further ado, I'd just like to hand over to uh, the Head of Philosophy, David Ritsa. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to the opening lecture for this series. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, a very distinguished speaker, Professor John Elliott is a, an Emeritus Professor of Education and Lifelong Learning, and his uh, contributions to research in the theory and practice of educational action research have uh, uh, encompassed areas such as curriculum and teacher development. He is uh, a Fellow of the UK Academy of Social Sciences. He has been honoured with doctorates from a number of institutions around the world. I shall mention the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, the uh, Jönköping University in Sweden and uh, the Hong Kong Institute of Education. Um, as uh, Jeff has announced, uh, uh, Professor Elliot's talk will revolve around the life and work of Lawrence Steinhaus, um, a figure who is clearly very close to UEA because he was the founding director of the Center for Applied Research in Education a figure also of uh, international renown for his contributions to educational theory. What we, I think, will learn tonight will be about the philosophical tradition within which we can situate Lawrence Stenhouse's work, and also we shall be learning about uh, his current relevance to today's educational concerns and uh, um, practice and theory. So I'm very pleased to introduce our Professor Elliot. Thank you very much. Well, I've given numerous lectures in this university, but this is the first time that I've actually given a lecture here in the lecture theatre in Thomas Paine. So, uh, uh, I'm still uh, a fairly active emeritus professor, so I think people think that uh, I should have retired to the golf course long ago, but my golf is so bad, uh, as was demonstrated this morning when I played nine holes before coming here, that I still uh, continue. Uh, actually, to be very interested in um, the boundaries between theory and practice. Now, L Lawrence Tenhouse, I, I, I was asked to talk about his relevance today. There is a Lawrence Tenhouse building opposite. And people very often say, who is Lawrence Stenhouse? Um, well, uh, there was a review of Lawrence Stenhouse's work in the Times Educational Supplement some years ago. Um, and he was described by the author of this review as a chess player in a world of drafts. Now, uh, that particular metaphor may not be felt to be appropriate by you, but what I want to suggest is that Stenhouse developed a big reputation uh, in this country um, because of the moves he made 
in terms of the links between the theory and the practice of education. And that is why I think um, he became called uh, by another academic, a chess player in a world of drafts. Now I, whoops, there we go. This is a photograph of Lawrence in his study. Uh, you can, those who know uh, the Lawrence Benhouse building might wish to guess which room it was. Um, but anyway, surrounded by papers with a pen in his hand uh, because he was always writing. Uh, now then, uh, Lawrence Stenhouse um, became the director of the Centre for Applied Research in Education, uh, which no longer exists now in the School of Education, but it lasted for many years, until about four, about four years ago, I think, something like that. Uh, so it was a very long-lasting centre, as research centres go. And it originated in this, uni this university had a bipartite structure. It had undergraduate teaching schools uh, that were created largely as interdisciplinary schools because the first vice chancellor of this university, Frank Thistlethwaite, uh, wanted to create a modern secular university and there were two uh, strong organisational values uh, that he brought with him as the Vice Chancellor. One was interdisciplinarity, because his argument basically was all the exciting knowledge of the future is going to be through the links created across disciplines. And a very good example of that, I think, in this university would be the School of Environmental Sciences. The School of Environmental Science, um, which is today largely still intact as it was uh, when this university was founded. And the second um, great principle of Frank Thistlethwaite was that instruction should largely be replaced by discussion. In other words, the students who came to UEA um, were to be put in a situation where knowledge became an object of speculation and reflection. Hence the importance of discussion. Frank uh, didn't deny the importance of lectures and things like this, but there was, if you like, a core activity which was small group discussion. Now, some people looking across the university can see that there are, uh, could I say, remnants <laughs> still of those two great principles uh, of the original vice chancellor of this university. Now, uh, you said, now come on, Kelly, you're supposed to be talking about Stenhouse, not Frank Thistlethwaite. But it might explain why Stenhouse came to land himself uh, with a number of other people, including myself, in the year 1970, before some of you would have been born. Uh, he came to land himself here at UEA as a new research centre because uh, it, it became one of a whole string of research centres uh, in the university sitting alongside but independent of the undergraduate teaching school. Now then, why was Stenhouse uh, here at UEA with a group of people that he had been working with on what became his big and most famous project, which was called the Humanities Curriculum Project. So I might ask people in the Faculty of Humanities who are here today, have they ever heard of the Humanities Curriculum Project? 
Possibly not. Well, you will hear quite a lot about that particular curriculum project tonight. But that was the founding project of the Centre for Applied Research in Education at this university. Why? Because uh, in those days, long ago, uh, the major policy influence shaping education in this country was a joint enterprise between central government and local government. And it was called the Schools Council for Curriculum Reform and Examination. And at the top of that organisation, they had, if you like, we call them chief executives nowadays, one chief executive was from central government, and his name was Geoffrey Caston, uh, and another was from local government, and his name was Jocelyn Owen. So Caston and Owen were so excited by the work that the original work they regarded of Lawrence Stenhouse. Um, uh, his work at, in London at Philippa Fawcett College of Education, where he had been sponsored by the Schools Council and by the Nuffield Foundation. Uh, Nuffield had sponsored many of the early curriculum reform projects in mathematics and in science. Um, but increasingly, the school's council uh, uh, wanted to take over a lot of the sponsoring, funding for um, the uh, curriculum developments in this country. And this was at a time of when a big problem was emerging. And the big problem was the raising of the school leaving age to 16 years old from 15. So when I started teaching, I did teach 16 year olds, but they stayed on at school voluntarily to do their GCSEs and things like this, because in the secondary modern schools, and I taught in one of them, uh, particularly good one I would add, uh, uh, people could leave, the students could leave school at 15. But this was considered to be a big problem, and especially in a certain curriculum area that was labelled the humanities. Because the humanities subjects in the curriculum, which were then seen as um, English, history, geography, religious studies, particularly, some economics. These were considered to be a major source of disaffection from our educational system. One of the reasons why people wanted, rushed to leave school, didn't volunteer for further studies, was that they were so cheesed off with being bored uh, by the teaching of these humanities subjects. And so the Schools Council, it sponsored a lot of research uh, called Inquiry One into uh, the humanities and the young school leader, and it found a very disaffected group of people. Um, who had had a bad experience of schooling, largely through the teaching of humanities subjects. Now, Stenhouse had a certain views about the secondary education curriculum, and uh, he was identified as a person who would help to solve this problem, so the school's council and Nuffield joined together and they funded him to mount a big project in preparation for the raising of the school leaving age and it was called the Humanities Project. Uh, now, um, I should say something uh, about Stenhouse's history uh, and its relevance to the topic. Uh, Nigel Norris, Professor 
Mr. Nigel Norris and I actually, not so long ago, only eight years ago, we actually produced, edited a book called The Curriculum, Pedagogy and Educational Research, which we edited and is published by Routledge. So if after my talk you get intrigued, particularly by Lawrence Stenhouse, there's an excellent biography of him in one of the chapters in this book by Nigel Norris. Uh, so, uh, he was born to do this big project and the school's council thought it was so innovatory they wanted all their future educational projects <coughs> to be counselled by Stenhouse and his team. So they thought we have to find a university <coughs> that is sympathetic to the ideas of this project, where we can locate Stenhouse and his team. And uh, Stenhouse himself had certain views about what that university might be. First of all, he didn't want a university with a school of education. He had been. Uh, before being recruited by the school's council. I should say very briefly that Stenhouse, uh, his father and mother, were Scots from Duke City. Who knows where Duke City is? Well, it's Dundee. And uh, his father worked for a Duke company in Dundee and he became a travelling salesman for this company and he tried, he was asked to develop business for this company in Manchester. So the Stenhouses moved to Manchester. Um, and uh, so he moved across the border into England. Uh, now, uh, what he ended up back in Scotland before the Humanities Project. And he became Head of Education at the biggest teacher training college in the British Commonwealth, which was Jordan Hill in Glasgow. And I bet, think he found himself sucked into a gigantic amount of bureaucracy that he thought would kill off any innovatory ideas that he'd got but he wrote a book about those innovatory ideas and it's called Culture and Education. And it's out of print, but some of us have got that book. It was originally published by Nelson and Stenhouse considered it to be the first book in this country of the sociology of educational knowledge. It was before Bernstein and before Young and the London Institute tradition in the sociology of knowledge. Um, and but many of his innovative ideas he had about curriculum and particularly in the role of the humanities subjects were there uh, in that book, Culture and Education. So, uh, what universities didn't have a school of education? Well, UEA was one. Another was Kent. And another was White. So we found ourselves trotting around these universities with no school of education. <laughs> and UEA, uh, I think Frank Blissethwaite and his colleagues in uh, in the registry, uh, thought, now his ideas match our ideas in this university. So, um, uh, the Centre for Applied Research and Education was born, but it was set up not by Stenhouse himself, but by the School's Council for Curriculum and Learning <coughs> Examinations, and not many people recognise that bit of the history of Stenhouse at UEA, which is where I spent rather probably
be too long, Tommy. Right. Now then, where was the next kinship, if you like, between some of the innovatory ideas that were being formed at UEA and Stenhouse's ideas? Well, Stenhouse considered, uh, it, it's quite interesting this, he considered his humanities project the basic ideas he felt were philosophical ideas about the nature of knowledge and understanding. And uh, he got this conception of knowledge as speculative. He argued from his own schooling, uh, particularly in the sixth form of Manchester Grammar School. Now, those of you who will know anything about Manchester Grammar School will know it's in the elite part of our educational system. And uh, Stenhouse argues that in that sixth form, uh, all the students were challenged to treat knowledge as provisional, open to criticism and critique, and an object for reflective discussion. And that what he was trying to do in the Humanities Project, sponsored by the Schools Council, was to make his experience in an elite institution uh, accessible to all the nation's children. That was the idea of the Humanities Project. <coughs> so he actually uh, uh, given his speculative view of knowledge he was very influenced by a particular philosopher of education by the name of Richard Peters. Now Richard Peters at that time was an internationally renowned uh, philosopher of education, but before a philosopher of education he was actually a philosopher of action. He wrote a very seminal book, I don't know if you've ever come across it, called The Concept of Motivation. Um, and uh, Richard Peters became the uh, Professor of Philosophy of Education in the London Institute of Education. And he produced perhaps his best known work, which is called Ethics and Education. In other words, his concept of education <coughs> Um, was framed by a set of values that he depicted as the defining values of a democracy. So there was a strong relationship between aims, educational aims, and democratic values. That was, um, and Stenhouse was very influenced by Richard Peters because he saw that connected with his experience in Manchester Grammar School uh, in the sixth form, largely. I should say that in the sixth form he studied, uh, guess what? He studied history, English, and French. Um, and some economics. Um, his history tutor was a man called R.F. Bunn, and when Nigel Norris was uh, writing his biography of Stenhouse, um, he actually visited the Bunn archive, which actually exists in Manchester Grammar School to this day. Um, so, uh, this 
led him, in thinking about the aims of education, it led him to think that knowledge and understanding were distorted if we used a particular planning model that had come across from the United States uh, and influenced by behaviorism. But in fact, before that, it had been a model used in this country uh, and, and, uh, in the early part of the 20th century under the label Codes of Practice. Uh, but behaviorism had sophisticated what became known as the objectives model of curriculum planning. <coughs> you cannot plan a curriculum unless you can specify your intended learning outcomes in measurable terms. Now, how many of us who have had experience in universities today are familiar with that model? Uh, I found that uh, most of the courses I taught at UEA, I was supposed to specify the objective in measurable terms. And of course, what you did was um, you tended to turn a blind eye to it if you adopted a said healthy position about planning the curriculum. Because given his epistemological position uh, of seeing knowledge as an object of reflective discussion, uh, the speculative view of knowledge, he argued that you should be analysing your aims, your educational aims, of, which would be the development of understanding, appropriately you analyse that not into pre-specified learning outcomes, but you analyse it into what Richard Peters called principles of procedure. So, uh, from your aim of, of understanding, you have principles of procedure. So, the model of curriculum, let's see if I... Stenhouse argued, a curriculum is an attempt to communicate the essential principles and features of an education proposal in such a form that it is open to critical scrutiny and capable of effective translation into practice. So, what he did uh, was to try to communicate the essential principles and features of a educational proposal for the teaching of the humanities. And he reconceptualized the humanities. Whether the humanities faculty at UEA would go along with this or not, I don't know. But he reconceptualized it for the purposes of mass education as the study of human values. And I think quite a lot of people wouldn't have any objections to that definition. Um, as a study of human values. So, he argued that the study of the humanities involved in studying human values, you were dealing with controversial value issues. Um, so the human acts situations that were the content of the humanities raised controversial issues uh, of human values. And so he found himself with people like me uh, and a few other teachers seconded to this project. Um, uh, our job <coughs> was to conceptualise the humanities as a controversial 
issues program, with the aim of which is developing an understanding of human acts, social situations, and the controversial issues they raise. And he argued that rather than um, translate that into behavioral objectives, you analyze it into procedural principles that are implied by that aim. And these furnished criteria for judgments about the quality of teaching and learning process that is aimed at the development of understanding. So, uh, they stated that reflective, he spelt out these principles, and they may seem uh, not particularly controversial to you, but I can tell you when he spelt these principles out, the media in England went wild about them. Uh, and uh, the teachers' unions came up objecting to them and all kinds of things. Now, Senator saw these really as democratic values uh, that were implied, democratic principles implied by an educational aim about the development of understanding. Uh, so these principles stated that reflective discussion should replace instruction as the main activity in the classroom. Not too far away from, thank Thistlethwaite's original vision <laughs> of pedagogy at UEA. Um, and that the teacher should be responsible for critical standards of reasoning in discussion. So the teacher had a role of intervening, asking critical questions uh, uh, about the points of view being put forward and articulated by, uh, by the students. Uh, and while doing that, while exercising that positive role, must nevertheless protect the expression of divergent views. Oh, people went wild about that. Protect divergent views. I think there was even a, a, a national headline that says Humanities Project is promoting divergent views about race. Right? Um, and of course, said us and say, no, I'm not talking about promoting divergent views. Divergent views exist. Students come into the classroom with a multiplicity of beliefs about the content of the humanities, about human acts and situations. And these divergent views, uh, that this divergent in the discussion needs to be protected. And this was the thing that really got the media going. Uh, the principle of procedural neutrality, that the teacher should adopt a procedurally neutral position on a controversial issues. Uh, um, uh, I have a, a wallet over there uh, which is full of um, old media articles. <laughs> even from the Telegraph and the Guardian and so on, debating the principle of procedural neutrality. And of course, most of the, and I was even invited to Balliol College, Oxford, to discuss with uh, Hugh Montefiore, one of the philosophers there, uh, the principle of procedural neutrality, which he agreed with. And, um, uh, the Institute of Philosophy in this country uh, had an annual conference one year in which all the big philosophers like uh, uh, R.M. Hare and uh, uh, Mary Warnock uh, 
debating the concept of neutral, the, the idea of the neutral teacher. And all I can say is that a lot of them, whether they were professional philosophers in universities or whether they were indeed um, not so much uh, from universities but from all walks of life, not just the teaching profession either. Uh, uh, they said, but the teacher cannot be neutral and should not be neutral. And Stenhouse's response was, of course he cannot be neutral. He's telling the children, it's because I can't be neutral that I'm adopting a procedurally neutral position. Um, and then people would argue, well, uh, what about if the teacher simply says, I'm introducing this point of view, um, and, but I, it's not to be given any more weight because of my authority position in the classroom to anybody else's view expressed in this group. Well, the position of the humanities project on that was, sure, if a teacher in a school can actually do that, and the children can be totally uninfluenced by his authority position in that classroom, then fine. But that is a matter for empirical research. In other words, the other thing that was integral to the humanities project design was what Stenhouse also became very famous for, and still today, uh, every school of education in every university in the country um, will be encouraging teachers to do research. Well, Stenhouse, who coined the idea of the teacher as a researcher, but I'm afraid <laughs> his idea of the teacher as a researcher uh, did get distorted by the objectives model that Stenhouse was trying, Stenhouse was trying to produce an educational proposal that did not distort the nature of knowledge and understanding as he understood it from his experience at Manchester Grammar School. Um, and uh, so uh, that became very important that uh, uh, the teacher should adopt a procedurally neutral position in discussion. Now, the Just a few words of text here on the nature of understanding, but I think I've more or less um, said something about this. But the second point he makes here, well, the first was that both students and teachers develop understanding. That is, the teacher, as a procedurally neutral chair, is cast in the role of a learner. And secondly, understanding is chosen as a name because it cannot be achieved. Understanding can always be deepened. And now, uh, moreover, there must always be dispute as to what constitutes a valid understanding. And it's very interesting, um, Victoria over there will know that um, uh, I do a lot of work at the moment in the field of uh, learning studies. Uh, learning studies hasn't really hit the universities in a big way, in the sense in which it's used across the world now in schools. Um, but learning study is a theory-informed pedagogy. Uh, and uh, uh, the theory that informs the pedagogy is called variation theory. And it was coined by um, Martin, and Booth at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden and is now uh, almost universally adopted uh, as a form of 
teacher research um, in schools. Um, and one of the things I've done quite a lot of work on recently is to show that Stenhouse's view of understanding um, is very, very similar to the view of understanding that is embedded in uh, variation theory. But anyway, uh, I don't want to go too much into variation theory tonight. So, um, so was, it seems that the best classroom pattern should be one of discussion, a discussion which aims at understanding cannot be merely an exchange of views. It must be a reflective inquiry fed by information. So, uh, Uh, the teacher, he argued, cannot be the source of that information. So, the teacher can't play devil's advocate and, if you like, uh, not distort the nature of the knowledge and understanding that they're aiming at. So, uh, uh, the discussion needs to be based on evidence. So what, how do you get a discussion that is based on evidence where the teacher, if you like, is chairing a an evidence-based discussion but they are not, if you like, uh, transmitting uh, their personal interpretation of that evidence to the students. And uh, this comes into what I was up to when I first joined this humanities project. Um, there were about 12 of these. They were published by Heinemann and they were multimedia evidence packs on the major areas of controversy as they were understood at the time, which was way back in the late 60s. So my job was to edit the War and Society Pact. And it not, not only included texts, poems, uh, extracts from uh, uh, research journals, uh, it also included, I sat uh, for days in the British Film Institute, uh, so it did extracts from films, from cafe newsreels, goodness knows what else. Um, so, that was one. Stenhouse himself did one. Interestingly called Relations Between the Sexes. Uh, the others were the family, people who work, law and order, education, uh, and there were one or two others. So, the idea was the teacher would sit, he'd have all this evidence in the classroom, and it would all be linked up through what was then called a multi coordinate indexing system. So a teacher listening to the discussion could think, ah, there's a point of view that's not being represented here, and he could, uh, as long as he was familiar with this material, he could identify a piece of evidence for a particular point of view, it might be a photograph. Because photographs were seen not necessarily as objective representations of a situation, but as representations of a point of view about that situation. Uh, representations of someone's understanding of that situation. So, uh, He argued, no evidence is in the last analysis objective and it is important for people to interpret and evaluate each piece of evidence. The group needs sources of information which place before it facts, insights into other people's point of view 
opportunities to project oneself imaginatively into other people's experience and some general impression of the cultural resources available in our civilization. It is a false strategy to look for authority and evidence, both because of this lack of objectivity and because the kind of value problems at stake in the discussion of controversial issues can never be solved without going beyond the evidence. Uh, so, uh, there was one more element, and I alluded to it just now, in the design of the Humanities Project, and that was the teacher could not realise these principles of procedure without undertaking a considerable amount of research in their own classroom. So, uh, for example, oh yes, I'm going to hold a discussion. And so, you hold a discussion, what do you do? You ask a question, someone in the class gives a point of view of that question, you ask another question, someone else gives another point of view of that question, and it goes question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. And you do that, and you don't even realise fully what you're doing. I remember uh, going into a classroom, and uh, uh, the teacher uh, was discussing some evidence, and then um, he said, uh, uh, someone in the class said something, and he said, the teacher said, Does, do we all agree with what John has just said? And then always, whether this was a classroom in Northumberland or whether it was a classroom in Brighton, always the same thing happened. There was silence. And the teacher would be looking around the class like this. And then some student somewhere opposite them would say yeah. And the teacher would say, good, let's move on then. And one of my jobs was to interview students about their experience of the pedagogical interventions of the teacher in the classroom. Teachers who espouse discussion, who espouse this aim of the development of understanding, but nevertheless, uh, they were drawing on a repertoire of pedagogical interventions that were more consistent, if you like, with the instructional mode than with the idea of reflective discussion. So, uh, when I, I remember interviewing some students. And I said to the students, uh, well, what did you think about that lesson? And they said, same as usual. So I said, well, since I'm not usually here, uh, what do you mean? They said, well, he always twists you round to his point of view in the end. And I looked at them and said, well, can you give me some examples? Yeah, said another boy. Didn't you notice how many times he said, do we all agree during that discussion? Uh, and it, when, I, when that recording or that interview was then fed back to the teacher, the teacher objected strongly. He said, I was not pressurising them for a consensus. I was trying to find out how many people agree and how many people disagree. So, uh, I left it for a while. Uh, and uh, the teacher came back to me, emailed me, and said, well, it was a little bit of both, you know. I was trying to wrap the lesson up in a nice, tidy way, because we'd been spending three or four weeks on this issue. Um, but, uh, so I was doing certain amount of pressurising. 
Uh, but I was also wanting them to discuss. So, I mean, the thing was, uh, the teachers then did, uh, with support of some members of the team, uh, uh, actually did some fairly systematic, what can be known as action research. So, uh, you mentioned uh, me and uh, action research. Well, I, yes, I suppose I've become a kind of Mr. Action Research a bit. But the action research that I've done has largely been within that, uh, what philosophically you would call deontological uh, uh, conception of the relationship between ends and means in education and not an instrumental conception about that relationship that you get in the objectives model. So today, the, um, uh, the teacher and researcher has become sponsored by a government. Teachers must do research into their effectiveness and achieving pre-specified learning objectives that are measurable in the classroom situation. That is teacher research largely today. That is precisely the opposite of what Stenhouse meant by teacher action research. And I'm not sure that Stenhouse had ever read, read Aristotle, uh, but Aristotle said some very interesting things in his Neomantium Ethics um, about the relationship between values and action. He said, you cannot really conceptualize and define your values independently of your attempts to realize those values in action. So in other words, you define your values through your practice. And that is precisely um, why Stenhouse uh, introduced the idea of the teacher as a researcher which was um, to enable uh, the teacher uh, to be able to define their values through the action that they take on the basis of the research that they do into their own classrooms. How am I doing for time? Seven more minutes. Well, I'll try and wrap it up in ten minutes, if I can. Uh, uh, now, I'm not. Just to go back a bit onto the neutral teacher, uh, we originally did not intend to bring in uh, the discussion of race in, in the classroom because it was covered by so much legislation. But the Schools Council wanted us, asked us, if we would please explore uh, the effects of uh, a trained, a teacher who was trained and, and effective at implementing these rational democratic principles uh, in the area of race relations. Because there had been previous research that had shown that the more the teacher discusses race in the classroom, the more uh, pupils become entrenched in their prejudices, particularly if the teacher adopts uh, the devil's advocate point of view. Uh, in other words, people become more entrenched when the discussion takes the form of an argumentative debate. Now, what we've done through the research that we've collaboratively undertaken with these teachers, uh, what we've done is, and R.S. Peters, who sat on the um, steering committee of the project, by the way, that's another interesting thing. Um, what we've done is to draw a distinction based on research into the implementation of these principles between reflective discussion 
and are the negative distractors. And what is, uh, has been sh shown by some research, uh, particularly on teaching about race in the context of further education, was that pupils became more entrenched in their prejudices. Um, so, uh, what ha would happen if the teacher, being procedurally neutral and able to implement these other procedural principles like protecting divergence, what would be the outcome of their attitudes uh, in the field of race relations? And basically, a very carefully controlled experiment was done on a pack of material uh, th that the project produced. And it was shown that basically, although further research had to be done, that A, it didn't seem to entrench pupils in their attitudes. It may not have changed them much, but it did make it worse. And there appear to be, particularly with respect to girls, there was an increasing uh, attitude of tolerance uh, on issues about race. So, now, some headlines in the newspaper. The race pact got leaked uh, and it hit the newspapers. Can a teacher be neutral about mass murder? That is a particular article by uh, a ex member of the Executive Committee of the National Union of Teachers. Pupils get race lessons, Sunday Times. Race lessons for teenage pupils dropped because as a result of all this publicity, the school's council ran uh, rather panicky <laughs> and uh, they decided to drop the race pack altogether so it never got published never saw the white of day why withdraw the race pack article in the Times educational supplement letters to the editor I just wanted to indicate there were quite a few and then the, the, the magazine education the cauldron bubbles on so you see uh, it attracted a lot of national publicity, the project, but when it came to the area of race, then there was a lot. Now, one intriguing thing, which, oh, I must have it over here somewhere. I just wanted to read you, and then I just want to mention something else for five minutes, and then I really will wrap it up. There was a book published by a man called Gordon Winter called Inside Boss. Boss being the Secret Service of the apartheid South African government. It said, another boss propaganda exercise was mounted in British newspapers in early June when a project member of the humanities, I'm not going to name him, uh, gave me advanced news that he was editing material for a race kit to be sold to British schools. The kit included posters, photographs, tape recordings of a controversial nature such as Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech and a photograph of a white mob lynching Negroes in America. Boss did not want me in use. Uh, sorry, Boss did not want me to use Enoch Powell or Harold Sorin as fronts for this story and suggested I use someone else. And then a man, a uh, refugee from South Africa, at the time was a freelance journalist in Fleet Street, and he had a senior position in the Commission for Racial Equality in London, and he was used <coughs> as an innocent cutout. I gave the story to him as an exclusive, and he passed it on to the Sunday Telegraph, which ran a balanced story on the subject. Over the next six months, regular articles appeared in other newspapers, and the subject became 
a controversial case. Uh, that in January 1972, the school's council announced it had decided not to approve the circulation of the race kit in British schools. So that's just something about the impact. But I want to, uh, I, we could have a general discussion about the relevance, but I just wanted to wind up uh, in terms of the contemporary relevance. Because uh, now in this day of hate mail, of uh, uh, people taking definitive stances on particular issues and trying to block people who have opposing views from having any say or platform, and it even happens in universities. Well, perhaps one of the great examples recently, and I did write a paper about it that no one would publish, but never mind, um, and oh, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry, I'll get there. And I'm talking about the statues, particularly the Colston statue. Oh, by the way, that is just a book that Professor Barry MacDonald and I edited and it was published by UEA um, in an occasional publication series of teachers doing case studies of their attempts to realise these procedural principles in action in their classrooms. And they're very good case studies. But unfortunately, um, I think uh, this is out of print as well. Right. So, in the UK and USA, statues of historically significant individuals now considered to hold racist and colonialist views become a focus for much of the anger felt by black people. Within the UK, the most dramatic expression of anger was vented on the statue of the 17th century slave trader, Edward Colston in Bristol, when it was toppled from its pedestal by protesters where it stood for 125 years and was dumped in the local harbour while the police simply stood and watched. Now, Someone I very much admire is a very eminent historian and people will have read stuff from him in the newspapers and he's on television a lot and that's David Alisoga, himself of mixed race heritage and he commented about the toppling of this statue. What repulsed many about the statue was not that it valorised Colston but that it was silent about his victims those whose lives were destroyed to build the fortune he lavished upon the city. He claimed that overnight the event achieved a level of historical significance when previous attempts to get the statue removed through the normal channels of local democracy had failed. It was, he argued, not so much an attack on history, but in itself of great historical significance. He then turned the spotlight on those who oppose the event. Those who lament the dawning of this day and who are appalled by what happened on Sunday need to ask themselves some difficult questions. Do they honestly believe that Bristol was a better place yesterday because the figure of a slave trader stood at its centre? Are they genuinely unable even now to understand why those descended from Colston's victims have always regarded his statue as an outrage and for decades pleaded for its removal. Um, now, how would the Humanities Project have handled that controversial issue uh, about the toppling of the statue? Uh, um, Stenhouse, I think, would have seen Oli Soga's view as an important source of evidence uh, to be fed into the discussion. But he might also wanted the, uh, the intervention of the Society of Merchant Venturers and what happened to that particular society 
to be represented as a divergent position. So the, the Society of Merchant Venturers, to which Colston belonged and was implicated in the slave trade, appears to have transformed a conversation about the wording of a corrected plaque into a confrontation. Um, but before, the sanitised version, that's a corrected plaque, was installed by the Mayor of Bristol. He intervened and postponed the event on the grounds that the issue about wording needed to be further extended to previously uninvolved sections of the community. In other words, the Mayor uh, of Bristol himself um, uh, a member of an ethnic uh, minority, um, he wanted the whole community involved in a conversation about this statue and what was going to happen to it. And it, as this was being initiated, then came the toppling of the statue into the water on May the 25th, which resulted in it being recovered and destined for a future in a local museum. Now, what Olusuga does not mention is not so much the argumentation that has surrounded the wording of the plaque, but the quiet and largely invisible conversations that resulted in an agreed form of words and the mayor's intention to widen and render them more inclusive. The stopping of the statue appeared to halt the process. This process of conversation involving the whole community of Bristol. It appeared to halt that process and change the situation to a site of struggle and conflict where there were winners and losers. Now, I just want to say that uh, the Society of Merchant Ventures, who had opposed uh, um, the topic or the removal of this statue, in engaging in this community-based conversation, themselves changed their view and their position. Um, and I think they ended up with the point, they would have ended up with a point of view where they would have wanted that statue perhaps placed in a museum. But uh, I think Stenhouse would have seen um, uh, that statue as, a, as an object for a reflective discussion uh, between different points of view, the outcome of which would have been, and one of the things people say, well, what's the point of just a reflective discussion if nothing happens? Well, things do happen, because what happens in a reflective discussion is that people modify and change their point of view in the light of the conversation that they're having with other people. Um, and I always use the word invoicing. The, uh, you deepen and develop your own understanding and your own point of view by invoicing the voice of others. And so you are always, if, if it's truly a reflective discussion, you are always modifying. And one of the problems we've got today is that in our society, we don't seem to have the equivalent of the Humanities Project and taking the Humanities Project and extending it into a uh, societal pedagogy so that its aims and principles become a framework, if you like, for public discourse. So I think I'll finish there. Uh, and just to say, if anybody wants a copy of these uh, PowerPoints, there's my email address, and there's the reference to the book on uh, the work of Lawrence Stenhouse. So thanks for being so patient.
And what Alfred was saying was somehow or other the pragmatic approach over the years has become rather more sustainable than uh, the various attempts to redefine the social sciences in universities as action research enterprises. Uh, but that's not the only other thing. I mean, I didn't mention it very much except in the book. Uh, teachers were doing case studies into the pedagogical problems of implementing the procedural democratic principles uh, as a means to their educational ends. And case studies became, I think it was the air and care that uh, case study methodology uh, in the field of education, uh, driven by the ideas of Stenhouse and my other colleague, Barry MacDonald, um, uh, became the main attack on an attempt to psychometricize the whole of educational research. Um, so there were spin offs. But I, I think actually, uh, going back to the chess player in the world of drafts, uh, I have been you know, we have generated um, databases, knowledge bases of how to realize these principles in different contexts of action. And still, if I go into schools today and I observe a discussion, I don't observe anything very much unlike what I used to observe 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, so, the idea of Stenhouse was to do this research so that teachers did not have to continuously reinvent the wheel when they were innovating pedagogically in their classrooms. And yet, unfortunately, uh, I see um, teachers still reinventing the wheel. Um, now, you can argue, yes, Stenhouse is relevant. And the idea of reflective discussion is extremely relevant. And Stenhouse saw that reflective discussion as a disciplined set of procedures. And we still don't have <coughs> any formal disciplined procedures to regulate discussion on controversial topics very much in this country. Um, so you could argue that his time has yet In fact, it seems that in some settings, discussion is actively disencouraged as not having pedagogical value. So my question is, what might be a good chess move for the current context working with the new and early career teachers in schools? Yeah, well, uh, I think that one, one of the problems has been uh, innovation in schools has not been accompanied so much by innovation in higher education. <laughs> um, and I think what attracted Stenhouse to UEA was at least historically UEA appeared to embrace uh, similar ideas to those of Stenhouse. And what you could argue is 
that the objective model has become so dominant, so part of established planning and practice, and you have to ask why. Because, and I think it's because um, of the systems of accountability that we have. Um, in other words, people are held accountable for the quantifiable outcomes of their practice. Now, what moves will change that? Well, I think mounting public criticism, a certain amount of political stability. I mean, one of the things we don't have in this country, we have elections at least every five years. So, uh, I had some colleagues in, uh, in uh, the School of Education. We worked for many years at the beginning of this century in Hong Kong, in the Hong Kong Institute of Education. Um, and on the curriculum reforms in Hong Kong. Um, and the thing uh, is that in Hong Kong, uh, whether they will do that now, I doubt it, but while democracy was still alive and flourishing in Hong Kong, they still had like a 10-year plan for reform and innovation, both in the higher education sector and in the school system. But what has happened here is um, still um, uh, pedagogy in, I'm not talking about UEA, I'm talking about the university system more generally. I'm not sure that uh, discussion replacing instruction is a dominant motive. So a smart move would be, how do you stop those moves in the sphere of higher education? Because if you can stop them in the sphere of higher education, then that will filter down into the school system. Um, I, we learn that you don't get too much innovation upwards in a social system. Uh, it's much more promising if you can affect change at the upper levels of the system, and then that will filter down. Well, look at, I mean, an excellent example of that is the Nuffield Maths and Science. Nuffield Maths and Science all started off at Winchester Public School. And my God, it flowed down and through uh, the um, uh, the school system in this country uh, and created a significant amount of change in mathematics and science teaching. Now, we were dealing with the average and below average academic ability students in schools on the humanities project. So we were expecting change to go upwards. But what we found was that you could get a change in the secondary modern schools, but the secondary modern schools were then amalgamated with the grammar schools to form comprehensive schools. And then you had politicians like Harold Wilson saying that the comprehensive schools are just like the good grammar schools. So, in other words, um, uh, a lot of innovation uh, was actually in the school system, was actually blocked. And this is a very controversial issue now. My late friend, uh, Brian Simon, and I used to argue about this enormously, because um, he was a great fan of comprehensive education, as I am. But I used to say that a lot of innovation was blocked by the merger between the innovatory secondary model and the comprehensive. Sorry, and the grammar school. Thank you, Steve. I was going to say, yeah. Oh, there are some questions, but I'll, I'll save the form to Steve follow up. Uh, and then we we'll could take the rest of the questions. Um, it's a beautiful principle. Um,
project and apply them to the organization of society as a whole. Uh, that seems to me, not touching pedagogy, not touching it out of school, uh, but that is interesting because uh, a reflective pedagogy in school needs, in a sense, to become a model for the organisation of relations within our society. Now, I actually feel a bit optimistic because I feel that things are now all almost running ahead. Now, we've had enough of argumentative debate. We've seen what argumentative debate does. It just entrenches people in their prejudices. And there are winners and there are losers. Now, we need a different social pedagogy. And we might draw on the work of Stenhouse. I mean, that to me is the relevance of that work. Uh, uh, draw on the work of Stenhouse and his colleagues in the Humanities Project uh, as one source of inspiration on which to affect a new kind of disciplined social pedagogy that will, um, if you like, filter into the whole field of human relations in our society. Does that make sense? saw the implementation of a national curriculum um, really uh, kind of slightly quash that yeah. in terms of um, uh, allowing students to explore mathematics themselves. I wonder if you could perhaps elucidate a little bit more about the ideas behind a humanities curriculum project and the speculative view of knowledge but actually link it into science and maths teaching, which I think has gone very much along the instructional um, processes, as opposed to this more kind of inclusive, rounded view of education. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, that's very interesting, because I mean, I understand very much about my own But I was a specialist teacher, secondary school teacher, of biology and religion. And that blows some people's minds. It didn't seem to be all that extraordinary. Um, I mean, I'd been a horticultural researcher before I trained to be a teacher. I was also a Methodist lay preacher. Um, now, one morning, um, my head teacher uh, ordered me to apply for a job on the humanities project at the Natural Science of the Guardian. But I was teaching science as well as religion. And I was trying to develop a form of science teaching that was discussion based. Afterwards, I found uh, what she said about mathematics. I remember some of the mathematicians here may have known of uh, an Oxford uh, maths tutor called Father Philip Walker. Uh, Eleanor, did she teach you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. There we are. And I was externally examining a PhD with her. And I said to her, I said, you know, uh, What is this about, you know, the, the objective model of lesson plans? Uh, in pre 
specified learning outcome. Uh, she said, oh, but, she said, if you're really teaching mathematics, you can't do that. You distort the nature of mathematical understanding. <laughs> she said, uh, 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 because there are different points of view uh, to be explored. Uh, so you can deepen your understanding of mathematical concepts. And this is why I got interested in lesson and learning study, which I haven't talked about tonight. But I've been trying to connect the work of Stenhouse with all that's going on across the globe, and it's a big global phenomenon of lesson and learning study, uh, which embraces all the disciplines. And so you find that um, if you take uh, Marton's theory of variation, uh, it's very often used in the context of the teaching of mathematics. <laughs> Uh, and I always said there are strong connections between uh, Marton and Booth's concepts of variation theory and Stenhouse's um, process model of teaching and learning, which is what I've been talking about tonight. And indeed, uh, um, when I was working with an academic uh, facilitator of a learning study in Hong Kong, a lady called uh, Lo Man Ming. Uh, she was interested in Stenhouse and um, uh, she reviewed a lot of his work and said there are very strong connections uh, between Marton uh, uh, and Booth and Stenhouse. Now, she was a chemistry teacher. So I see. Uh, 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 I think Stenhouse would say, he would certainly say, oh, he was an English teacher, actually. He spent two or three years teaching English in Scotland. He was one of these people who lived from one side of the border to another because he then did an MA at the University of Glasgow. And then he taught a staff tutor at the Institute of Education in, New in, in Newcastle, which was then part of the University of Durham. And then he went back to Scotland to Jordan Hill. So he was constantly crossing the border. But he was a kind of, um, it, it, it wasn't that he didn't talk about the other disciplines. And indeed, in the humanities project, he brought in social science research and other kinds of research as evidence in the discussion materials that could be linked to controversial issues. And for years, I always wanted to work with, I used to liaise with people in environmental science faculty here at UVA, and say, can't we launch some uh, applied research, some action research, into the problems of teaching climate change? Because I've always, and Stenhouse himself went to Australia and gave it on a lecture tour, and he said, well, if I was advising the list of topics, and it's got to be memory died in 1982, um, uh, if I was to advise the list of topics for the humanities project, I would have included the environment. So I think uh, that uh, he was, his view of knowledge was not just linked to the humanities because he saw, um, if you like, uh, all evidence as a matter of interpretation and conjecture. And as someone, I, mean, I haven't mentioned this either, I mean, I came as a teacher, appointed to the humanities project, and the first thing Stenhouse did was ordered me virtually to go to the London Institute of Education and study philosophy with Richard Peters. Um, uh, and uh, so I think his view of knowledge, although he constantly uses references to history, uh, 
that is the influence of Barnum except Manchester Grammar School. Um, but he would not be averse, I think, to teaching uh, science to a kind of reflective discussion, pedagogy, or teaching any other discipline of knowledge. Does that address some of your questions? Thank you very much. <coughs> well, as we draw this around to uh, close, I'd like to thank you all for joining the panel. I'd like to ask you to join me in.